It's Subverted Tropes, a podcast about movies, featuring your hosts, Daniel Spencer and Kate Harlow. Welcome to another episode of Subverted Tropes. I'm Dan. I'm Kate. Hey, Kate. Hey, Dan. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. Kate, do you remember what we did on our second date? We went bowling. We went bowling. Mm-hmm. I love bowling. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. You know who else loves bowling? Chris Hardwick's father. Sure. He's uh, actually a well-renowned bowler. I don't remember his name, though. Okay. I feel like you were leading me to something there. I was. Okay. And it's the dude. Yes. The dude loves bowling. Yes. So today we're going to be talking about The Big Lebowski. Amazing. Uh, the Big Lebowski, I would say, is one of the, it's, if not the most well known, one of the most well known Coen Brothers movies. Joel and Ethan Coen mm-hmm. wrote, directed, produced, edited. I would say, even if people don't know it as a Coen Brothers, it's one of the most pervasive pop culture movies yeah. of the past several decades. Agreed. So, the movie tells the story of Jeff Lebowski, Mm -hmm. burnout extraordinaire, (laughs) who is this laid-back, surfer-like in in how he talks, just kind of chill dude. He gets caught up in a series of mistaken identity mishaps (laughs) and is soon wrapped up in crazy plots with ransoms and, uh, you know, money drop-offs and dismembered toes so it's uh it's it's a delightful romp it's a goofy film (laughs) so tell me about it certainly jeff lebowski Mm -hmm. is played by jeff bridges Mm -hmm. uh he is referred to as the dude Mm -hmm. uh the character of the dude was actually inspired by a movie producer that the coen brothers met while trying to get distribution for their first movie blood simple oh uh, the man whose name is Jeff Dowd uh, actually went by the dude, <laughs> actually drank white Russians, which are the dude's signature drink, and we will be enjoying while we watch the movie. Mm. Uh, there's also another man that they knew uh-huh. who lived in a kind of trashy apartment, but was really, really proud of one certain rug that he had. <laughs> Most of the characters in this movie were actually based off of people that the Coen brothers knew yeah. or just like more, you're more famous people. Yeah. Julianne Moore's character, Maud, mm-hmm. is partially based off of Yoko Ono. Okay. And also an artist they knew who had a swing in her studio for painting. Nice. Uh, so they took traits and aspects of the lives of these people they knew and... Like verbatim put them into the movie. Amazing. With the exception of the character of Jesus Quintana. Okay. The Jesus. The Jesus. As played by John Turturro. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Jesus was a character written for Turturro. Mm-hmm. With John Turturro in mind as the basis for the character as well. Oh, no. <laughs> kind of. So in 1988, the Coen brothers uh, saw a play that he was in mm-hmm. where he played a very weird character. Yeah. And they wanted to bring that back, mm-hmm. basically. So they're like, we're going to write this role for you in this movie. Nice. So they actually started writing the screenplay for the movie right around the time that uh, the movie Barton Fink came out their movie Barton Fink came out uh-huh. which was in 1991 mm-hmm. this movie was released in 1998 oh wow okay okay uh so they had they wrote the script with several actors in mind yeah they wrote the part of Walter for John Goodman of course they wrote the part of the narrator for Sam Elliott yeah they wrote the part of Donnie mm-hmm. for Steve Buscemi yes and obviously they wrote the Jesus for John Turturro. So they. So did they do literally everybody except for the dude? Pretty much. Uh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They like they knew. It's like okay. Well, we're gonna write 
this character who's based off of this person specifically for this actor or actress who's going to mm-hmm. uh, to play them. And they knew they wanted John Goodman. Mm-hmm. But in 1991, he was busy mm-hmm. on a TV show called Roseanne. The Good Years. Sure. If uh, you go back and look at the, the original run, it has a lot of merit. Okay. I will believe you. My mother said so. Okay. I will believe your mother. <laughs> but they couldn't make the movie because John Goodman was busy. And they'd already, at that point, they had cast Jeff Bridges as the dude, but he was making the movie Wild Bill, so he okay. wasn't available either. So they said, well, we'll come back to this later. We are committed to these people, and we will wait until we have these people. Exactly. Okay. In the meantime, we're going to make Fargo. Mm, yeah. And they made Fargo. <laughs> bowling plays a large part in this movie. It does. Which is why we discussed bowling. Earlier. I thought you just wanted to be sweet and talk about our second date. I mean, yeah. That was the night I introduced you to the McElroys. That's a good point. So the reason that uh, bowling was chosen to be heavily featured in the movie, mm-hmm. according to Joel Cohen, it was that it was important in reflecting that period at the end of the 50s and the beginning of the 60s uh, that suited the retro side of the movie. Mm-hmm. Slightly anachronistic, which sent us to uh, a back to a not-so-far-away era but one that was well and truly gone nonetheless. So he liked the idea of having a retro feel to it while also keeping it in today's... Yeah. Well, I say today. This was 20 years ago, but, you know. I still feel like it translates very well to today. Yeah. I think... It's been a long time since I've seen it all the way through. Same, but... Again, I think it's that pop culture influence that keeps it still feeling very relevant in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And I would say bowling has hung on over the years in that, that kind of retro way where people are still very like, Oh man, I haven't been bowling in forever, but I love it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's fair. So then once everybody was ready, when their schedules opened up, uh, Polygram and Working Titles Films, who had backed Fargo, mm-hmm. backed The Big Lebowski with $15 million. Mm-hmm. They showed a finished version of the script to Jeff Bridges, and he said, did you guys hang out with me in high school? Because the <laughs> laid-back, chill surfer vibe was exactly the one implemented by Bridges when he was in his teenage years. So they unintentionally wrote... This character based on this actor for this actor to be this character. Exactly. Without knowing it. Yes. Ah! Was brilliant. That is very brilliant. So uh, at one point, Bridges was expecting the rewrites uh, as a, you know, veteran of the movie industry. He knew that rewrites to the script would be coming, Mm -hmm. but... He hadn't heard anything or seen anything about him, so he called up John Goodman mm-hmm. and said, "Hey, when are like when are we going to get these script rewrites?" Mm-hmm. And John Goodman said, "You're in Cohen Brothers territory. They don't do rewrites." <laughs> Brilliant. So uh, it was the script was basically delivered as penned. My. My heart wanted it to be like they did rewrites for everybody except for the dude. And it was just like, oh, no, you don't have to worry about that. (laughs) That would be hilarious. So there's some contention. Mm -hmm. Jeff Bridges say, say, Jeff Bridges say. Jeff Bridges say. Jeff Bridges say that he and John Goodman improvised almost all their lines. Oh, that kind of contention. John Goodman says that's not the case. They delivered... As written. As written in the script. And the Coen brothers don't usually cotton to improvising in their movies. They don't like ad-libbing. Right. They like you know, their movies to be done as exactly in the script. Yeah. Uh, so it's there's, there's some uncertainty there. I, there is a conversation of uncertainty, but... Looking at the other Coen Brothers projects and looking at which actor has returned to very nearly all of them, 
I would tend to believe Goodman. Yeah. Yeah. Which is sad because I adore Jeff Bridges and I think he is a fantastic talent, but the the little bit of ego saying, Oh yeah, no, 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 we we did that is mm, not the best. Yeah. Yeah. Uh well that's what I've got for the first part of the movie. Let's go make some white Russians. Let's go make some white Russians. And we're back. Hello. Hello. That's such a good one. It is. It's one of those ones that I'm always like, I always really enjoy when I watch it. But then on the in the times between viewings, I'm like, yeah, it's a, it's a fine movie. Yeah. Um, it, it's one of those ones that I, I see and I'm like, why don't I watch this more often? And it's just because there are so many things that I watch all the time. And that one's it, being a Coen's Brothers movie is a little trippy and a little out there, so I don't know. Mm-hmm. It's not always a go-to for me. Yeah. But... Coen Brothers movies are that, like, they're great movies on a rainy, like, Saturday afternoon. Yeah. Because they're a little bit on the slower side. They're quirky. There's usually some... Sad stuff somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. Melancholy. Melancholy is good, uh, but they're still entertaining. Yeah, I would th- not even just a Saturday afternoon, but like any any rainy afternoon, or like not that we're in school anymore, but like if you had a like a a half day from school for like teacher development or one of those kind of weird early dismissal days. Yeah, and you couldn't go out and play. Be perfect. You know, because all those elementary school kids. Would watch watching their Cohen brothers. Oh yeah, especially this movie. Yeah, particularly this, not this one. Vulgar in any way? No, not at all. There's not a gratuitous amount of breasts and sex. Mm-mm. And the no. language is the language fine, super fine, totally normal. Everything's fine. Yes. Speaking of language, yes, let's talk about some of the words used in that movie. Mm, okay. I'm going to give you uh, three different words okay. that I have the count of. Oh, goodness. Either the word or a variation on that word Okay, it is used mm-hmm. a certain number of times. Okay. If you're asking me to supply you with a number, I'm going I'm to I'm not going to ask you to supply me with a number. I'm okay. going to ask you of the three, which one do you think was used the most? Fuck. Okay. Well, I don't even have to supply you the others <laughs> then. Fuck or some variation of the word is used... 262 times oh throughout the movie. Okay. Two, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's that's not correct. Uh, that's That would be absurd. 262. How much? 292. Okay, thank you. 292 times throughout a, uh, a an hour and 17. I'm sorry. An hour and 57. 117 minutes. So if we... <laughs> okay. Okay. That's that's two and a half fuck or variation of fuck. Two and a half a minute. <laughs> what, okay, what about dude? What's the word count on dude? Because I know there has to be one of the other ones. 160 times it's spoken and it's visualized the one time that we see it in gutter balls. Amazing. Okay, what's the last one? Because I don't know what the last one is. Man... Okay, fair. Now, I don't have, to be fair, I don't have the count for the full cast. Mm -hmm. But But just the dude? Just the dude says man 147 times, which is one and a half times a minute. That's amazing. It's absolutely insane. Uh, So, the dude is unemployed, Mm -hmm. but... Seems to have been unemployed for a while. Like, you get that feel. Yeah. Uh, and he talks about it a little bit in his post-coital scene. Mm-hmm. But, uh, like, he's getting royalties from a book that he wrote. Yeah. He was part of the Seattle Seven, which yep. was a uh, you know group of seven seafood restaurants that got a settlement from Exxon Valdez. Okay. Uh, All right. But... Also, uh, they originally had it that he was an heir to the Rubik's Cube fortune. <laughs> but they never brought that up. Like, they uh, had it written and they took it out. Oh, man. Which is a shame. It is. 
That's great, though. So, uh, before each, like, before they filmed each scene that Jeff Bridges was in, mm-hmm. he would ask the Cohen brothers, did the dude burn one on the way over? <laughs> if they said yes, he would make sure to act a little more yeah. burnt. Mm-hmm. But most importantly, he would rub his knuckles in his eyes mm-hmm. to make them look a little more bloodshot. Nice. That's a nice touch. That's some that's some good dedication. It's detail. It's little detail. Little details. Similar little details. In the quick scene that we get of the Jesus going door to door, <laughs> there is a sizable bulge in his pants. Oh, no. It was a bag of bird seed that they stuffed in John <laughs> Turturro's pants. John, 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 John. Uh, look, we're, we're going to have you doing this scene where you're going door to door, telling everyone that you're a terrible person. <laughs> but we want to make sure that, like, the That'd Jesus be- would have his wang out for everyone to see it. Mm-hmm. So we're just going to stuff this bird seed down your pants. Mm-hmm. So here you go. So the Jesus is, as we discussed, very, very interesting out there character. Yeah. Rooted in uh, quite a bit of absurdity. Mm-hmm. Yes. The Coen brothers have outright said they will never make a sequel to this movie. But I know a thing about it. You, no, I'll let you. No, no, no. Go ahead. John Turturro wrote a spinoff about the Jesus and starred and directed it himself. Uh, so it's not out yet. Oh, it's not out yet? No. Okay. Um, but yeah, he specifically got the permission right from the, the Coen brothers ah. to do it. It's He's remaking a French film, but adding the Jesus in as one of the characters instead. The French movie <laughs> is called Going Places. It's a weird and dark movie that's kind of similar to Henry Portrait of a Killer. Oh, gosh. Okay. Um, but it seems like they're going more in a comedy direction with it mm-hmm. and using the Jesus as a character. So I'm very interested That's to see. an intriguing concept. It's a very intriguing concept. It's a very intriguing concept. John Goodman mm-hmm. has said many times that this was the best, like the most fun he has ever had in any role that he's been in. He had such a blast with this role, and I think that's very evident. Like, he's yeah, I I think it a complete goober, <laughs> and it's just a delight to watch. It is. So that's actually all that I have for the movie. I will say one of my favorite Coen Brothers anecdotes is that uh, there there are there's another set of Coen Coens. I'm not sure if they're brothers or not. They are not allowed to call themselves the Coen Brothers. Uh, but they are the directors of the Garfield franchise. Oh, boy. Uh, and that's how Bill Murray wound up in that. Because somebody sent a request to him that he be a part of it. And all he saw was the Coens. And he immediately agreed without reading the script. Because he trusts so much in the Cohen brothers that whatever they offered him, he would do. And it wasn't until much, much, much later that he realized he was not, in fact, in a Coen Brothers movie. That is amazing. <laughs> wait, wait. You're directing with the... Where's Joel or Ethan? You know, you know Joel, Joel and Ethan. <laughs> the Coens. Yeah, no, wrong, wrong ones. Insane. Um, yes. So. so let's talk about some of the tropes in this movie. Yes, I'm very curious about what you found because it's such an out there uh, thing. Well, absurdism is without a doubt one of the tropes. Okay. Uh, this movie I mean, is yeah. rooted in absurdism. Like ev- ev- everything in this movie is absurd. Yes. The berserk button trope. Um, which was used in The Jerk mm-hmm. when the N-word was dropped mm-hmm. uh, and Navin flipped out. Yes. In this case, you could really do anything in Walter's direction and you'd hit his berserk button. That's true. John Goodman's character flips out at everything. He's a very passionate man. Yes. A bittersweet ending. That it is. It's true. 
Poor Donnie. It's not particular. Like, yeah, Donnie's story is very sad. It is. Um, and that funeral scene is heartbreaking, uh, especially just Walter, who's been so angry this whole time, being mm-hmm. so sad. Yeah. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. a bummer. It is. Uh, we've got the breaking of the fourth wall. Yes. The stranger does at the end. Yes. Uh, catchphrases. Definitely mm-hmm. we've got several. Yes. Shut the fuck up, Donnie. Poor Donnie. Am I wrong? Well, which Walter says a ton of times. Yes. We believe in nothing. <laughs> when this, uh, so censored for comedy, that uh, in the redone version for TV. Yeah. This is what happens when you fuck a stranger in the ass. It is. Changes into, this is what happens when you find a stranger in the Alps. This is what happens when you feed a stoner scrambled eggs. The Coen brothers chose that dialogue. Amazing. To make it make as little sense as possible. Good. Uh, we've got anti-heroes. Yes. With, I mean, the dude. Walter. But yeah. Walter definitely. Uh, dude wears our car. Yeah. As a trope. <laughs> which, um, fun thing about that, the title of the movie, Dude Wears My Car, mm-hmm. is inspired by the line, Dude, where is your car? Yeah. Uh, from this movie. <laughs> uh, there is the, the narrator entering the plot, even if jo- just for like a brief minute. Yeah. Because we meet the stranger a little bit earlier on before we see him at the end. But he is the narrator from the outset. It's a, an affectionate parody mm-hmm. of like film noir style, yeah. detective style movies. Yeah. But in this case, everyone is just bumbling. <laughs> yes. Yes. So it's a fun mess. Yeah. I tweeted while we were watching that I will never ever get over looking at people's baby faces when we watch a movie that in my head, it doesn't seem like it's that old of a movie, but it was 20, 20 years, years ago, ago, which is like a terrifying concept to me. But like... B- baby Philip Seymour Hoffman, baby Steve Buscemi, <laughs> baby Julianne Moore, even, um, and y- like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say baby, but like much younger John Goodman and much younger Jeff Bridges, just yeah, just wow. Everybody's the babies twenty not. years younger. It's crazy. It's, it's crazy. It's just it's amazing to see. Yeah. But it and it doesn't it really doesn't feel to me like it's a twenty year old film. Yeah, I think the anachronisms in it really help to keep it updated. Yeah, with the exception of the the phone, phone, the car phone, the the mobile phone that he's given. <laughs> yeah, that's really like the only the only thing that doesn't keep until now. But like everything else, just kind of feels like well, I mean, we're not in. A major metropolitan area, but yeah, I mean, that, that it's could, all tracks. Yeah, it's it's very interesting. It's very interesting. It is okay. All right. So that's all we got today. That's all we got today. Thanks so much for uh, listening. Speaking of listening, go give a listen to the podcast. Guess what you're gonna hate? It is a podcast done by a couple of our friends, Kate and Janine, and I actually just appeared as a guest on their show to talk about Arrested Development. Uh, that episode came out last Wednesday, so go go check it out and listen to their uh, other stuff because it's it's a very fun show. Mm-hmm. Uh, so go give that a listen. Yeah, you can always find us on iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, YouTube, Spotify. We're gonna double check and see if we're available on Google Play. We should be wherever you find your your good good podcast material. If you want to follow us on the social medias, you can find us on Instagram and Twitter at Subverted Tropes. We are also on Facebook. I think it's, is it Subverted Subverted Tropes Tropes Podcast? Podcast. Yep. And if you have any questions, comments, anything like that, send them to us at Subverted Tropes. Recommendations. Recommendations. Suggestions. Sure. Constructive criticism. Yes. Send them to us at Subverted Tropecast at gmail.com. We would love to get some ideas of keywords to search for our Netflix keyword month, 
where we will take your keywords and use them and uh, look up movies on Netflix and uh, pick some bizarre stuff to watch. Yeah. We, as always, we'll have our blog post up at subvertedtropecast.wordpress.com. You can see pictures of our fantastic uh, associate producer, Ripley. Mm-hmm. You can see the white Russians that we made mm-hmm. to uh, enjoy this movie with, which were delicious. And as always, we would love to throw out a big thank you to Gracie Boland for our fantastic logo. You can find her on the social medias. Her Instagram and YouTube are a modern unicorn. She does tarot readings and other cool stuff like that that I'm not great at putting into words. But she's an incredible human and we love her. Yes, indeed. So thank you very much for tuning in. Our next episode is going to be Robin Hood, Men Men in Tights. Tights. And uh, we'll be doing that and then probably getting into a month, uh, another month of guest episodes. Yeah. So we'll have a blast with that. And uh, thanks so much for tuning in, everybody. Give us a like, give us a rating, give us a subscribe, tell a friend, and have a great week. All that good stuff. All right. Bye. Bye.